Okay, I'm going to walk through regular effective contact, and what I'm using is a PowerPoint slide. And you probably are wondering, why doesn't he just put the PowerPoint up and throw a voice recording on the PowerPoint? Um, that's a good question, and I know a number of uh, teachers have asked about this um, in the training that we've done over the last few weeks. And I'll tell you uh, the real reason is because those are not ADA compliant. Um, a deaf student would not be able to follow along if you have narration to go with the slides. And a blind student would have trouble with the slides themselves. Um, what um, recording the slide on YouTube and posting it to YouTube does is, number one, everybody gets the narration. The number two thing is they provide the captions so the deaf students can follow along to any explanation you're giving to the PowerPoint slide. So know that PowerPoint slides, even with narration on it, will not be ADA compliant. In most cases, you probably won't have a deaf or blind student in your class, but eventually you will. Um, and then those materials become something you cannot use um, because you need to make your resources available to everyone. Now, the other thing I want to give you is a little bit of a pro tip um, because I know you're going to find my voice and my uh, PowerPoint slides engaging. Let me show you a little bit of thing that you can do with a YouTube video. Um, and let me jump over to a YouTube video. This is a video. One of the things you do learn to do is to adjust the speed of the video. Now, I know everybody is fascinated by my talk um, going through the PowerPoint. What you can do is slow it way down so it takes twice as long. Um, if you do that, you're going to need a special kind of help. What you can also do is speed it up a little bit so it takes less time. Um, this is something I would encourage you to show your students. Um, they do tune, tune out to videos uh, when they seem to be going too slow. If they bump the speed up to 1.25 or, God forbid, 1.5, really it only gets distorted at 1.5. And please tell me you're not going to turn the uh, speed up to um, uh, 175, because that's incredibly fast. But if the students can crank up the speed a little bit, as you're probably doing right now, um, it actually helps them pay attention a little bit better to what's going on. Okay, so let me come back to the class um, and come back to the PowerPoint. <clears throat> okay, and let's walk through this. Okay, now a bit of a disclaimer. I do want to make sure this information is designed to help you, help you with ideas, tips, and tools to engage students in the first week of your online uh, class. But please understand that the tips we'll go through are, are good for the entire semester. The goal is to give you an idea of what constitutes regular effective contact. It's also called regular substantive interaction before the course begins and in the first week of an online class. So you want to grab the student's attention right from the beginning and show them that they are going to need to be engaged in the course, um, that they're not just opening the syllabus, saying yeah, blah, blah, and then walking away. You want to get them involved in the course from the beginning. What we're not doing is telling you how to teach with this slideshow presentation. You really are the discipline expert, and you know whatever field you're working in, and with this group, it's library science, or it's going to be in counseling, or it's in English. You know best what will work with them. And so this should not at all encroach upon your expertise and what you know works in your field, because it's going to be different um, in English or in library science or in counseling than it's going to be, say, in physics or archaeology or anthropology or biology or nursing. <clears throat> you are going to use your expertise to guide you through this and to make your selections. So what I won't be doing is going through and telling you specifically use this tool. I, well, I will float some tools as we go through this, okay? So regular effective contact or regular substantive interaction, what it is, um, it really comes down to five required elements in an online and hybrid course. Um, and these elements, I really want to insist upon what I said before, that you mix them and put them together, emphasize or de-emphasize them according to what you know works for your class in your field. 
Um, all are required. All these five elements, you've got to make them go. They're, they're quite easy. Um, and you're going to want to use them anyway. <clears throat> but you don't have to use them, as I said, in the same proportion. You might emphasize or de-emphasize one or the other. Um, emphasize, you, you will find that in your discipline, certain things will work better. But also in your method of teaching, certain things are going to work for you in your style as an instructor. So there's going to be considerations within your discipline, but also you and what you think you can make work best. And it's going to be your personality um, and your expertise in one software or, or another application. Um, but the big thing is, um, and this is going back to what we know now, the uh, letters we know, ACC, JC, JC, what can be documented? And so those five that I'm going to go through are documented elements of regular effective contact. So these can be documented. They can be shown. I did this. I did that. Here it is. So when they come knocking on the door and ask to see that you are actually engaging with the students, you can show them, number one, your threaded discussions, where the students went back and forth with each other and with you. Also, email. These are emails you've sent to them. And what I'm going to emphasize is the inbox in Canvas. I will come back to that as we get through the semester. Um, that is going to be the best way to interact with the students um, through email. So email in your regular um, Canvas, or excuse me, your regular email, um, the Microsoft email that we have now. That's not the best way we're going to be using the inbox within Canvas. And we'll review that if you're not familiar with it. Um, because that's the best way you can document that you've interacted with the students in your class, in this class, in this English 101. Um, the announcements that go out in the learning management system, the LMS, at least once a week. It shows that you've been keeping tabs on assignments and on the students and know what's going on, and they know um, what's going on. They do have a class with an instructor who's guiding them. Okay. Um, timely and substantive feedback. This is usually the feedback that we give students on their assignments. Okay, so do you record videos and send it to them, or do you um, send out uh, messages through inbox, or how do you send that so that they know um, you are a human being at the other end and an expert in your field? Um, instructor original content. In other words, e-lectures and videos that you create. Um, this is what distinguishes your course, okay? Um, and it avoids the, as we're going to go into the plug and play aspect that some people engage in with um, uh, publisher material. Um, you can use publishers' materials, but you want to be making sure you produce a substantial amount of your content, okay? Now, in the beginning, um, when you've created a really dynamic and interesting course, how do you get students to get involved? In other words, how do you wake them up? Um, this gets into the issue of having a presence in the class, um, that this is your class and they are going to be involved with you as an instructor. Um, there are tools, and it's always important to know you do not have a physical presence there. So there are tools you're going to use, email, announcements, videos, other things, to create your presence, okay? So what tools are available? We're going to be going through that to engage the students from the beginning. It's not just tools to post materials. It's tools that are involved in the engagement. That's what a regular effective contact is all about, <clears throat> okay? So let's go into a little pre-course contact because that can be a little bit touchy with some folks, okay? So is your REC policy in your um, syllabus? Now, you don't need to state that the REC policy, the regular effective contact policy is. You just need to make sure that the students know that they're going to be engaged, um, that they can't just, you know, uh, like to watch, um, like Chauncey Gardner, and just go along. They cannot be passive in the class, you know, and just sit down and go through their computer screen. Do they know what active engagement means? What tools are they going to be using? How and how often? Do they expect their interaction to be measured? In other words, is there going to be some form of the grade tied to it? I would encourage you to do that. Okay. So, and we're going to go through some sample syllabi by the end um, from some of the instructors um, from different disciplines, history and sociology and an English one. Okay. 
What is required in your syllabus and in your Canvas course? Evidence of regular effective contact. ACCJC does ask to see it when they go through and they audit what's going on in the classes. They do want to see that there's interaction, videos, emails, announcements, other things, um, that the students are not just going in there, picking up the reading, and then eventually dropping off an essay. So they want to see evidence of that. And again, I'll go through the tools, through the inbox, the announcements, and other things that allow you to provide evidence of interaction. Um, so evidence of student active participation, even during the first week. Yes, right from the go, you should get them involved. Um, so contact the students who are slackers. They aren't really engaged. Um, they're on the list. They think that's enough. They really don't think you're paying attention. Um, keep in mind that many students have different conceptions about how online classes work. Um, you're not going to easily unroot, uproot those um, conceptions unless you contact the students who did not make their presence known in the first week. Um, I would encourage you to go through the inbox or other means and get a hold of them and state very clearly what's expected of them. Why didn't you take part in the discussion? I need you in the survey. Um, it's due, you know, by Wednesday. Um, create the expectations. So clear and direct directions to the students on what they are responsible for. Um, for many students, this might be, it probably is the first time they've had an online course. And especially under our current um, uh, pandemic situation, they probably didn't choose this situation in many cases. So be very direct with what's expected of them and expect to hold their hands. So there's information on the instructor, contact information, turnaround time, and frequency. They should know if they email you, how about how long it's going to take um, to return the emails, the messages, and things like that. Um, there is no one single way, and I'm going to emphasize this throughout the training, to accomplish regular effective contact or just about anything in an online uh, class. Use your best judgment. Um, we're going to explore the tools throughout the semester or throughout this training um, that are going to work probably best. And I'll go through the tips of what works and what doesn't seem to in a bit. <clears throat> okay. So recommendations for some of the early engagement. These are things you can to get the students running um, right when they hit the class. Can you open your on class uh, online class two weeks before the start of the date? A week before? Um, probably shouldn't. <clears throat> okay. Um, what I've seen in my experience is I will get students demanding the class be open a month before. Um, they have a notion of the class as a correspondence course. Um, you can open it for some students. Um, some students from Access, uh, for example, um, would like to get in there so that they can have the materials uh, translated into Braille, or they want to make sure that there's going to be captions available and things like that. Um, so some of the reading materials and some of the videos and some of the other uh, materials, some of the content can be opened up a week before or so or two days, two weeks before. Um, but what you don't want to do is give the students access to the assignments. Okay, um, You don't want them basically completing the assignments beforehand or handing it off to somebody else to complete once the semester starts. Or they might start shopping around for instructors. In other words, how is the easiest way I can get an A or a B? Um, so I would encourage you to, well, you're not supposed to open the assignments, um, but I would encourage you to resist um, many of the requests um, that you open up the class early. If you do have a situation um, where you do think it would be best that some of the students get in there, I fully trust your expertise. Um, you do know best, um, but you might want to resist letting students into the assignments <clears throat> um, and be careful with, you know, how you open the doors and that you do it consistently. Do you welcome students before the start date? You know, send them out a welcome letter or something else or an emailed announcement or a welcome video. I personally use welcome videos because I like them to see who I am and how I go about things. Um, you will see examples of these, um, and we're going to go through some of these. Um, Tracy sent me some example letters. Um, she doesn't, she's getting used to making videos, um, but she likes the letters, and whichever you think is best is the way to go. Okay? So the authorization codes, when students start asking you for authorization codes um, to add students, um, well, we just had a discussion about this. 
um, and you will want to contact the student with the authorization code, um, you will need to contact them through WebAdvisor. And if you're going to give them an authorization code, um, but be careful with how you add students because you don't want to over enroll <clears throat> um, your classes. Or if you do want to, that's that's your your judgment. Um, but you want to be careful that <clears throat> you're giving out for spaces that um, do exist. Okay. Now, by the first day of class, you should have a course calendar and a welcome. Um, a course calendar should map out what's going to be asked of them throughout the semester. And I'm going to come back to the syllabus um, that's built within Canvas. It does put essentially a calendar together. There are two basic approaches to understanding how the progress of the course is going to move. Um, the course calendar is one functionality within Canvas and you should put that together. It can be difficult for screen readers. If your students are blind, they're going to be use, using screen readers in the course calendar that comes with Canvas can be a challenge. Um, the syllabus that comes with Canvas does essentially the same thing, but it's built off the assignments you have built into the course. We will go through the syllabus later on in the semester. So have a welcome announcement, an orientation module, and materials to walk them through your expectations. Okay, um, There's a syllabus um, <clears throat> to go through things, the Canvas syllabus if you have all the assignments. Um, again, the Canvas syllabus, some teachers really don't like it. <clears throat> um, but if you can put all your assignments together before you open the doors, the Canvas syllabus can be a magnificent tool and it can be used by screen readers very effectively. <clears throat> okay, so if you've got all your ducks in a row before the semester starts, the Canvas syllabus can be very helpful. Okay, and you do want to check on student access, okay, or who is in there by using the people in Canvas. That's a way to see who's moving through the class, who's just watching, and who hasn't shown up. Going to the people function or the people um, link is a good way because it shows you who's been in the class and who hasn't gotten in there yet. Okay, and let me cover one more slide before we break off to the next half. Um, <clears throat> so in the first week, um, the goal is to demonstrate regular effective contact by you and active engagement by the students. Are they really in the class or are they Chauncey Gardner and just there to watch? Here are the suggestions. Create a pre-course survey now, one little thing I want to give you a heads up on, um, that's in what's called Canvas Quizzes. Um, <clears throat> we are moving over to what's called New Quizzes. That is actually an outside um, vendor who has created something for Canvas. Um, <clears throat> this is currently being debated and go on, going back and forth um, within Canvas and also within the campus, um, within our uh, contract with Canvas. Um, surveys might not be available in the next year. So they are a good idea, they do work well, but they are only in Canvas quizzes. When we move over entirely to new quizzes, the survey function is not necessarily active. That is being debated and being hashed out right now. So I want to be, you to be aware that the survey is a great way to engage your students it might not be a long-term strategy. Okay, um, you Set up an introductory discussion where people introduce themselves or express some of their interests. A syllabus and course materials quiz is a very good idea. I know many instructors use these in their regular face-to-face -face classes to see if the students understand how the structure, the structure of the class works and what the expectations are of them. Um, there's a, a, an orientation, a synchronous online meeting um, so there are tools such as Big Blue Button and Zoom, which many of you have used. Those are synchronous. They get the students into the class and they meet you online. They see you, in most cases, and interact with you. Those are a good idea. Those need to take place only during class time, regularly scheduled class time. This can be difficult if it's an online class and you try to schedule a meeting. Um, if the class is scheduled as an online class, it does not have a regular scheduled time. Um, so scheduling a synchronous online meeting using Zoom or Big Blue, Big Blue Button could be a problem. 
If, however, you have a regularly scheduled time and you've been moved online, then that meeting, the synchronous meeting, must take place within the parameters of the scheduling of time. Okay, so I'll go over this again. So if you have a regularly scheduled class, the synchronous discussion has to take place during that scheduled time. Okay, all right, I'll finish this up with uh, 10 more slides in a bit in part two. Take care.